All right, so I think we'll get started with our next module. Um, so I guess everyone's got a chance to try things out on the command line, get a sense of uh, doing some bioinformatics, got to listen to Will most of the morning, and uh, you're, you're on your way. So uh, this module is a little bit shorter, I guess, than some of our other ones, mostly because it's just focused on a, a, single, a single tool, but it, it fits in nicely with um, what we've talked about already with 16S, and um, it's a tool that we continue to develop, so I guess it makes sense that we, that we bring it up here as well. So I'm going to talk about PyCrust, um, and more generally, I guess, about metagenomic inference. Um, I was originally supposed to talk again tomorrow, and so usually it, during that time I do my self-plugs about a couple of things, but since I don't have the time tomorrow, because I'm not going to be here, Gavin, my student's going to give that, that lecture. Um, but I will just give a quick plug about um, a couple of little things. Uh, so one is I do run a microbiome sequencing service out of our lab called the IMR, or the Integrated Microbiome Resource. Uh, we launched it in 2015, um, mostly to service uh, local samples. There's lots of different places to do microbiome sequencing. You, you heard about uh, a service here this morning. Um, but we've done quite a bit of uh, sequencing since we launched, uh, so we've now hit 50,000 samples. Um, and those are over a large number of projects and a large number of investigators, uh, and uh, mostly in North America, but also in Europe and, and around the world. Um, and so a lot of my research focuses on human-associated microbiomes, but uh, at the IMR we've uh, basically handled lots of different things. So if you're not on here, then you know, you could send us samples and we could have a new logo just for you. Um, but always looking at liquid environments uh, like oil, uh, sorry, not oil, uh, ocean and, and, and fresh water and wastewater, uh, but also host associated and, and food products that are solid environments. Um, that's all I'm really going to do about that because you didn't come here to get a paid advertisement, although it's, it's not a commercial company or anything, it's just run out of my lab. Um, you can check out the website where there is prices there. Uh, and, a, and a queue and some idea about what you would submit for DNA. So we tend to take either DNA that's already been extracted is usually what we take, but we will take uh, samples as well and do the extraction for you. Um, along with that, I guess, uh, was coupled with it was just this need to, you know, come up with standard operating procedures uh, for the bioinformatics uh, and also to provide tutorials for workshops like these. So. Um, and last year we published this uh, paper called Microbiome Helper, which was meant as this resource that incorporated different aspects. So one is it uh, has some scripts, which are basically some glue, which you know do just some basic file format changes between, say, biome and stamp, or biome to human, or maybe paralyzes some steps. Um, it also has a wiki where we have sort of step-by-step tutorials outlined, and so those keep getting developed over time, and so that's where we're hosting the PyCrest tutorial you'll do today, and then also the metagenomics tutorials you do tomorrow. Uh, and then we also do have some sequencing protocols on there, so if you're interested in the wet lab side uh, and how that's done, that's all hosted there. It does get updated, and so I'd encourage you to look at that. Um, along with that, we tend to um, still, I guess, develop different, or test different methods out there. So uh, we heard a little bit about 16S and Chime 2 and uh, methods like Data2 for uh, making Amplicon sequence variants. Um, so we have this preprint that we just got revised. If you're interested in it, I'll, I can send you the revised version because it's, it's more newer than the preprint that's out there right now. Um, but just where we compare three different denoising methods. So Data2, uh, Doubler, and Unoise. Uh, and just compare those to a, a reference uh, picking approach. I won't go into the details, but overall they tend to have pretty similar uh, results on beta diversity. So if you look at a PicoA plot, they look pretty similar, or even at sequence composition. But if you're really interested in um, alpha diversity or the number of species in a sample, then they vastly, they vastly differ. And so you have to take that into account. Okay, so moving on to what I really want to talk about is uh, pie crust. So the idea here is that um, if you're working with, say, 16S data, you're going to do some bioinformatics, which some of you just did in your previous lab, to eventually get to uh, an OTU table. So you can see this here, yeah. 
<clears throat> say an OTU table, or this could be a table of ASVs or sub OTUs, whatever you like to call them, where obviously each feature is a row and then each column is a different sample. And then from that, you would get, you know, you could do alpha diversity, you could look at PicoA plots and beta diversity, you could test individual taxonomic differences, uh, look at stack bar charts or heat maps, lots of downstream things. And similarly with metagenomics, uh, you can use different methods also to find out sort of who is there uh, using different approaches to find out what tax are in that sample. And so that'll be covered more tomorrow morning. And then of course also with metagenomics you find out not just sort of who is there but what are they doing. So you can <clears throat> annotate genes with particular functional classes uh, and then eventually get to maybe a table of say, in this case these are keg orthologs or they could be EC numbers. Uh, and then you can use that information to collapse them into, say, pathways. Um, and then from there, you do similar things where you want to compare the differences of different functional classes and maybe talk about uh, the ability to have different, uh, the different repertoire of functional abilities within that community. So that's great. So PyCrust essentially um, tries to predict this table, so these uh, functional table of abundances of gene abundances, from the information given by 16S data from, say, an OTU table. And so this was published in 2013, um, and then has been used quite a bit, and really it probably wasn't updated much until just the past, I guess, six months to a year, uh, where now Gavin, my PhD student, has been working on it, and we're starting to push out PyCrust too. So the idea behind PyCrust is really just from a sort of a basic level is this idea that we're going to leverage uh, reference genome databases. So we have really large genome databases in say Patrick or NCBI or IMG where we have tens of thousands of reference genomes that have been isolated and sequenced. And then for each of those you could in theory collapse them or you can collapse them into different functional uh, databases and count whether that's present or absent for a particular gene or whether there's more than one copy of a particular gene. So these are again are say keg orthologs. So K0001 is alcohol dehydrogenase. dehydrogenase. <clears throat> and um, so say in genome Y that's, that's absent uh, and in genome X uh, there's four copies of it, right? So that's just what that's representing, collapsing that information. And the idea here is that you would provide say an OTU table where uh, in your community within sample one, say you have 10 copies of this OTU1. And the idea is really to say, um, can we predict you know, what the functional repertoire would be of say this OTU that's been sequenced? And so if the 16S was 100% identical between this OTU and genome X, you might have a good idea of what the functional ability is of that genome. You wouldn't still know for 100% sure because you can actually have 100% identical 16S genes and still get variation in functional content. But you would at least know that it's probably a specific species at that level uh, and you might have a pretty good idea of what's in that. Um, but then what happens if you don't have a good reference genome for that and say your near 16S sequence is say 80% identical, then that's a lot harder to figure out what would be in that genome and then how to basically collapse that information to come up with some community prediction. And so this is what PyCrest is trying to do, although some methods essentially just do this version and then just take the nearest neighbor approach. So that's what, say, PyFillin does, which basically was developed after PyCrest, which basically just takes a, the nearest neighbor and then just says that's what the functional content is. But PyCrest tries to predict uh, it with uh, phylogenetic methods. Okay. So... At this point, I would usually describe more about PyCrust 1, but now I can talk about its limitations and then how we're sort of overcoming those. So with PyCrust 1, uh, you can only use reference-based OTUs. Uh, we'll mention this briefly. This is where you're assigning sequences to a reference database, but then anything that was left over before, you basically had to discard those OTUs. Um, so any, any sequences that didn't match your database, we weren't making predictions on. It also only worked with green genes. Um, and this is because we pre-calculated most of our predictions ahead of time for those OTUs. <clears throat> and so if you used any other taxonomic database, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work, which was not ideal because lots of people have their preference towards, say, RDP or Silva, especially now that Green Genes hasn't been updated for a while. Um, 
also, more and more people are often doing genomics on the side, so they might have a particular environment that they're really interested in, uh, and they're doing their sequencing genomes particularly for that environment, and they want to help, you know, put those into the PyCrest pipeline so that then that will help enable better prediction. So actually, just a couple weeks ago, uh, a new tool came out called CalPy, uh, and essentially they they use PyCrest to uh, they use the PyCrest pipeline but they're supplementing it with genome information from cow rumens. Uh, and so they're really interested in applying uh, PyCrust on that particular environment, and so they sort of branded it as cow pie. Um, and with PyCrust 1, it was computationally fast, um, but that came at the expense of it not really being flexible because it was all pre-calculated ahead of time. Okay, so the, the new pipeline looks like, uh, looks like this. And so I'm going to walk you through the different steps here. Um, but just to draw into one thing is that um, our input here is both the sequence, uh, sequences themselves. So I'm going to use the term ASVs for amplicon sequence variants. But these are the actual 16S sequences. Uh, and then also their abundances. And beforehand, when you used to use PyCrest 1, you would essentially start at this step down here, this last portion. Uh, and then all of this up here was pre-calculated. But now we're basically, as a user, you're going to run these parts of the pipeline yourself, but it gives us much more flexibility in what you can provide as an input to PyCrust. Okay, so the inputs for PyCrust are essentially a 16S FASTA file, uh, and, so, and then an abundance table for those sequences. And the IDs have to match between those two. Those are the only things. Um, so those sequences can be either from OTUs, so you could do any sort of de novo or open reference uh, approach. And usually with an OTU approach, approach, you would pick representative sequences. And if you've heard of Unifrac, those representative sequences are what get fed into Unifrac for your tree that does that calculation. So um, you can do that approach. Uh, it's in, important to re realize that this is all phylogenetics, so there's no actual taxonomy used at any point. So it doesn't matter if you're using green genes or silver for assigning taxonomy. It only looks at the actual sequences, the 16S sequences themselves, and places them into a phylogenetic tree. So there's no taxonomy involved here. Um, or you can use some of the newer methods, like I mentioned before, that denoise or correct for 16S sequences. So in theory, you would have a little bit better resolution down to 100%, and you can feed those corrected sequences into PyCrust. OK, so those are our inputs in gray. And then I'm just going to highlight what this first step does. So um, with this approach, basically what we're doing is we're trying to take our reference tree. Uh, so if you imagine this being our reference 16S tree for all genomes that have been sequenced in our database, uh, we're trying to place these reads from our environment into this context to get a tree that looks like this. And so we use two existing methods. So PAPARA is this um, multiple sequence alignment method that's phylogenetically aware. So it, it takes uh, as a reference the multiple sequence alignment as well as the tree and places your 6 and S sequences into this multiple sequence alignment. And then EPA and G, EPA stands for Evolutionary Placement Algorithm. Don't know what NG stands for. Gavin, do you know? Next generation. Next generation. I should have known that. Um, which was, uh, I guess it's still in preprint in 2018, but just recently. EPA was published before, but the NG version, which is much faster, has just come out. But the idea is at this point, then we have our community sequences now placed in this reference genome tree. That's shown in blue. Everyone follow me so far? OK. So then the next part is actually predicting that genome content um, for, our, for our community sequences. Uh, and for that, uh, you can use different hidden state prediction methods. Uh, in each of those cases, what it's looking at is for each trait, and so by trait I mean a gene family, um, you're going to give that to the algorithm and you're going to load those onto the tree. So this is what the algorithm sort of sees. So those are the numbers in red. So absent, present, absent, uh, and then also it can take uh, higher copy numbers of that, of that trait. And the method is trying to predict basically uh, for these question marks what it thinks the, what the trait is at that value. And so there's different methods for that. 
uh, maximum parsimony, maximum likelihood, um, and, and other methods uh, within different packages. So originally we used to use a R package called Ape, but this cast store package got uh, published this year in 2018 uh, and really speeds up this prediction so it's, it's much faster. Um, and so before this would take uh, basically weeks on a, on, a, on a cluster, and so now you can sort of do it in real time. Uh, it just takes a few hours for, depending on how many sequences you have. So right now you can easily choose that option, uh, but PyCrest 2 defaults to maximum parsimony right now. Um, and so at, this idea is that then you're going to get predictions. So this is a fairly easy example, right? So with maximum parsimony for this question mark, you're going to probably guess a three because that's both the descendants and its ancestors have three copies. This one may be a one or a zero, although it'd probably weight more towards a zero with higher probability, and this guy would probably be uh, two. And then you're going to repeat that for each gene family that you're trying to predict. Okay. So now the final part is taking those individual predictions from all your individual sequences that you've given the file, and then basically just combining that into, into the community. So uh, what's nice is you can do this both to correct the OTU table for 6NS copy number and also to make functional predictions. Uh, so you may know or may not know is that multiple, um, many genomes, microbial genomes, have more than one copy of 6NS. Uh, and so that tends to be pretty much ignored by most of the field, although there's been a couple of other papers that have acknowledged that and have tried to address it in different ways. Um, but obviously this can really bias your results where if you have multiple copies uh, of a 16S, and that would be represented two or threefold times more uh, in, your, in your table. So we make predictions for 16S copy number um, for each of your sequences, and then essentially just normalize your OTU table by that number. So in this case, we're just dividing simply by the, by the copy number for each, each number in this table. Uh, and before, it was kind of annoying because you couldn't really use this table because it was only restricted to OTUs for reference space. But now, there's no reason why you can't use this OTU table for, um, for your downstream methods that rely on that. All right, so that makes far sense so far? OK. And then the, the last part is essentially just doing that those functional predictions now. So again, uh, this is an example where we've used keg predictions, but these could be EC numbers. And this table was, pre was calculated in your previous step, and now you're just simply multiplying uh, the abundance of your ASV or OTU by the copy number that's predicted in that, geno in that genome to then get a, a sum for your actual functional community table, right? So to get this value 13, you're essentially just multiplying this uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 ASV by this functional number. So 2 times 4, 1 times 1, and 2 times 2 adds up to 13. All right, does that make sense? Bada bing, bada boom. OK. So the, the major output from PyCrest is then uh, you can either get functional tables that could be keg orthologs and pathways. Uh, EC numbers and metacyte pathways. Um, and then you can also remove Spurrier's pathways via MinPath. So the, the major outputs are keg orthologs or EC numbers or COGS. Uh, and then to get to keg pathways, uh, we use MinPath to remove any Spurrier's pathways, which is a bit different than with PyCrest 1. And the same thing with metacyte pathways, uh, they require EC numbers to, to say if they're present or not. Uh, and in addition to the, the functional tables, you would also get um, links to between the tax and the function. So you can get stratified outputs. So you not only get a count of the function, but how the different uh, organisms in that sample contribute to that function. So um, this is just an example for an individual KO across multiple samples. And so instead of just seeing one, the count of that abundance of that particular K orthologue across these samples, you also get the taxonomic breakdown for that. And that's sometimes uh, really informative. So this, say the second sample looks pretty much like the others, but you see then that there's actually a completely different microbe contributing that function. OK, um, and then so for evaluation, just to I guess to let you know how we evaluate it, uh, the idea is that right now we pretty much always evaluate by using 6NS sequencing and shotgun sequencing from the same sample. So some 
uh, a few different studies have done sequencing where they've done 6NS and MED genomics from the same samples. And then we basically ask, if we take the 6NS sequencing and then do predictions with PyCrust, how well does that correlate with the actual functional annotations from the shotgun metagenomics? Um, and in the 2013 paper, um, there's a, a series of figures, which I'm not going to go into great detail except for two, uh, and you can look at more of them uh, in the paper if you like. But this is just showing in sort of an overview where this is a PCA uh, overlaying both the pie crust predictions and the metagenomic data correlating with that uh, across different body sites uh, from the HMP data set. So you can sort of see that the colors match up, although you do see a slight shift with the lighter colors, which are the pie crust predictions for each of the body sites. And then we also showed um, that as your sample has higher diversity, and especially diversity that's not well represented by a reference database, that our accuracy will tend to drop over that distance. And so this distance from reference databases is represented by this nearest reference genome, uh, sort of nearest mm, NSTI, what's it stand for? Nearest sequence taxon index, sorry. I should know that. Um, and then, so this is essentially the weight of uh, all the members within the community to its nearest sequenced um, reference genome database. Reference genome, sorry. Uh, and so what you see with human samples, you have really good representation within reference genome databases because that's the bias that we sort of sequence towards. So that uh, nested value is fairly, fairly low. And then as you go out to uh, really more diverse samples, so this is this hypersaline that was really acknowledged for having organisms that we hadn't seen well before are, are out here. Uh, and then this is just a spearman with how well uh, PyCrest predicted the metagenome annotations. So you can get this nest value uh, with the PyCrest predictions for your particular sample, so you can know where your sample lies in, uh, on this plot. Um, so since, uh, so these are just a couple of results, I guess, that are, are new to PyCrust 2. Um, so first here is just showing the null distribution. So null here just means that if you took a random distribution of genes uh, across those genomes as a prediction, this is the type of correlation you would tend to get. Uh, and so that's fairly high, and that essentially makes sense because there's a lot of core genes that you would expect to be the same. Uh, and even if you just randomly guess a genome, you're going to get a, a pretty decent correlation by itself. Uh, and this is PyCrust 1. And then these are some different things that we tried with PyCrust 2. So PIC is the ancestral state reconstruction method or hidden state prediction method we use with PyCrust 1. And this is maximum parsimony. So we do see a slight improvement uh, between those two. Um, and then reference sequences and all sequences is reference sequences just means only those that hit the database from before and all sequences now is including all variants, which we thought would have a bigger effect, um, but is fairly minimal. But either way, PyCrest 2 is slightly better than PyCrest 1 uh, and the correlations are, are, are still pretty high. We also compared across a few different methods that have been published since PyCrest 2. So PyFillin I mentioned before is this nearest neighbor approach. Uh, tax for fun is another approach that was based uh, similarly, but it, it used uh, the Silva database, uh, and PanFP was another method as well. And all the methods actually do uh, fairly well, and so you'll see reports from them about that they're pretty high accuracy. Um, but overall, we're still doing uh, better with with PyCrest two, shown here with maximum parsimony. Okay, and then with that, I'll leave you a little tidbit. So people often ask, what about 18S? Because this is all 16S focused. Uh, and we're not really sure about 18S for now, mostly because we don't have nearly as many reference genomes uh, for microbial eukaryotes as we do for bacteria. And so we're pretty tentative on this. Um, but interestingly enough, if you can plug in uh, an 18S tree and 18S genomes into the pipeline, and this is just a leave one note validation where we hold out the genome that we're trying to predict and make a prediction for it and see how well it correlated. So the correlation is really good compared to the null, um, but still this should be taken with a grain of salt. We haven't really tested this much beyond that. It could just mean that it doesn't really represent well if you sample a completely new microbial eukaryote that doesn't, hasn't been sequenced before, it, it could really do much worse. Uh, but we are trying to validate this on, on, a, on a community data set where we have paired 18S and metagenomics, and it's mostly microbial eukaryotes. 
Okay, and with that, I'd like to present you my amazing new acknowledgments slide, which was just generated uh, last night. Actually, the, yeah, it's just last night. Um, so this is an amazing PCOA plot representing members of my lab that was just sequenced, uh, finished yesterday. And so this is how we place into our PCA plot based on stool samples. <laughs> if, you, uh, if you come to my lab, you're promised a free sample. Your first one's free. You too can share in the data plot. I won't reveal any more details beyond that. <laughs> Just a PCA plot. We'll get into how much acromancy everyone has. Um, so these are the members of my lab, and I should really just point out, obviously, uh, Gavin Douglas is the, the TA here and is actually going to give a lecture tomorrow, but he's been the primary developer for PyCrust 2. Uh, so all acknowledgments go to him now for the, uh, for the development on that. He's done a great job. Uh, and obviously, obviously, funding on top of that. So I'd love to take questions, because I actually kept within my time. Though PyCrest 2, before we move to the lab. Thoughts? Yep. Yeah, uh, I was wondering, what, what is your perspective on uh, correlating uh, the functions uh, that you identify with uh, clinical outcomes? Because I've seen uh, a few papers in the last few years looking at, say, correlation of you know, microbial functions that one identifies with PyCrest. Sure. Right. So, I, I mean, I, th I think that's what people want to use PyCrust for, essentially, right? Um, so my default on that is, is two-sided. So PyCrust has this uh, love-hate relationship where I think people love to use it because if you have 6 ns data, it gives you some idea about maybe what functions may be in those organisms, right? And then the hate comes, I think, from the other side where they say, but it's still a prediction. And so people tend to maybe get caught up in overstating um, their confidence in that, right? So sometimes I have slides where I have this nice example where, um, and I won't go into great detail, but anyway, a, a paper got bashed online because it was based on PyCrest predictions and then it got overblown into saying that a particular metabolite was produced which has been associated with a disease and so it got a little bit thrown out of proportion with like oral health and uh, I believe cardiac arrest and then coming up with like a pro magical probiotic mouthwash that could, that could solve everything. So, I mean, it's the same as with metagenomics, right? So if you do metagenomics, you're going to get uh, gene abundances, right? And that still doesn't mean that, one, those functions are doing what you think they're doing uh, because the annotation could be wrong. And two, they're not transcribed unless you're doing metatranscriptomics, which John's going to talk about. Uh, and three, you're not going to do, you're, you don't have the metabolite produced as well. So it's, even with the metagenome, it's not you know a gold standard that that's completely linked to the clinical outcome. So you can tell there's a lot of caveats there around what I'm saying. But I guess the idea is yes, it does give a prediction that's fairly robust, and the idea is that's hypothesis generating, right? And then the idea is that you would follow that up with something more targeted for that function that you're interested in downstream. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Question here. Sharing really interesting. Um, I had a question about the source data, as well as potentially in the downstream analysis, accounting for uncertainty or variability in the phylogenetic breadth of applicability of the functional annotation. So I would imagine some genes are much more conserved across different lineages, right? Maybe their function. So I'm just wondering, really, is there yeah. generally a rule thumb about the phylogenetic applicability of the function? Like, can you account for the uncertainty downstream? Yeah, so um, I can repeat the question. So she's getting at the, the point of certain functions being probably better predicted because either their core is better conserved with 6NS phylogeny versus others which may not be as reliable. So that, that's definitely true. When we looked in PyCrust 1 at functional categories, we did see a, a definitely a, a change in, in certain classes of functions, although they were all pretty high, although... The keg doesn't actually focus much on, say, antibiotic resistance genes, um, which a lot of people are interested in, and then uh, are probably notoriously associated with LGT, right? And so that would be a class that we would presume we would do a bit worse in. Um, and we, from a long, long time ago, I did have suggestion that those results were a little less confident. With PyCrest 2, we are talking about, uh, we actually get probabilities for each gene family, for each prediction. And we're just trying to figure out, I guess, the best way 
then end user uses that at this point. So if you dig into it, we can provide the, the probabilities for a particular function being in that genome. Um, and then we're hoping at least to one have maybe some cutoff to say, no, this function you shouldn't really you know, use at all. Uh, and then also on the other side of it is some ASVs may just be really poorly predicted because one, they get placed wrong in the tree or are super divergent. Uh, and so we're looking at ways to maybe say, no, we can't make the prediction on, on these and those, so they shouldn't be incorporated. But with PyPress 1, we basically just gave it all to the user um, and left it to them. So we're trying to make a few ways to give warnings. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yep. So uh, as you mentioned, uh, AMR, and I had a question about like, can you predict AMR or something like more virulence of a particular strain? Yeah. Um, it's uh, something we're interested to know, like which strains are more pathogenic versus right. Which are. <coughs> So, uh, so I'm, I'm torn on that answer a little bit. So um, my PhD days would say no, like, and as a microbiologist, I think I would say no, not very reliably, because I think people understand really well that virulence can easily be dropped, right? I mean, you have E. coli strains that are notorious for being super virulent or just a lab strain, right, is the, is the typical example. Um, but I spent PhD days on LGT where you would see genomic islands come into particular genomes and they would confer new virulence and that's the same, you know, it's just another strain. And so that's not detected by pie crust. Um, so I would be weary of that. So pie crust 2 doesn't make, say, a prediction on virulence. Um, that being said, there is a method called bug base, which essentially uses pie crust in the background to make predictions about gram positive, gram negative, and uh, I believe virulence, either as virulence factors or something around that. Um, and they show all right accuracy, so I, I think it depends what you're saying. I mean, it might work as a community scale. I mean, people even associate just a larger amount of proteobacteria as bad because they tend to have a lot more of the pathogens within them, right? And so if that's the sort of scale you're going at, yeah, PyCrest would actually give you quantitatively that information. But is it going to say for sure if a strain is virulent or not? Definitely, def definitely no. Uh, like association of the genes at least the categories that these genes could be involved in. Yeah, you can. Yeah, absolutely. So you can get definitely those predictions. It's just, um, I think it's probably the one category that's really interesting and two that we'll probably have to, I think, robustly take a look at with PyCrest2 to, to make a better comment on that. So it's something that we haven't looked at recently to look at their correlation to, but, to see how well it works. But if, for example, we have the database of virulence genes, and there are many, like Patrick has its own. Yep. And specialized virulence gene database and virulence vector database. Can we take those set of genes and, and put them in the pipeline? Yes. Yeah. So all you would need is um, you'll see in the module, but uh, you would provide the pipeline. Uh, this uh, this file here, trait values of reference sequences, right? So. Um, you would need those along with their placement in a tree, right? Uh, and so the methods would be there to make that tree and then also to provide that. But yes, and then you would just run the pipeline the same way. And when is this coming out? So PyCrest 2 is definitely publicly available. You're going to use it in the module today. Uh, we sort of technically, I guess, are calling it beta. Um, we're pretty confident on its accuracy overall. Uh, I know Gavin's making still just a few tweaks maybe to the to the reference tree a little bit just because there's some long branches there that you might see in the tutorial. Um, but we're pretty confident in its predictions right now, um, and it's just more flexible at this point. Um, so yeah, so it's available now. We're hoping to put a paper out maybe late this summer. Yeah. yeah. So with a prediction, is there like a consistent type of error that Pycross makes? Consistent error? Yeah. Uh, well, in, in which way? So like what is, so the accuracy is around, I believe, 85, 90 percent right now. So for human samples, yeah. So consists of that left or 10 percent. What is that error being made by? Oh, so that's, that's a good question. So um, it's being made by, in, in theory, it's being made by certain ASVs or sequences, us not making good predictions on their genomes. 
Um, and that's definitely true, and that's what I would say most of the areas. The thing is, our gold standard in this case is a, is a, is a metagenome that's been functionally annotated, right? And has, it, we're not doing like an in silico an approximation, which we, we could do, but there's problems with that as well. So our gold standard is a metagenome that's been functionally annotated with HUMAN2, and so there's lots of different ways to do that. Um, and so us achieving 100% accuracy is, is just not going to ever happen even in the perfect case, because there's just differences, right? Um, and so there's error coming from, from that and the sequencing depth of, of the metagenome that we're comparing to. Um, we can get, as, as I mentioned before, probabilities on the actual individual traits and, and try to model that, uh, and then provide that to the user in some fashion too, but it's, we're still working on that a little bit. Because it's a probability of each trait for each ASV within your community, and then you have to do a combination on them. Yeah, one more and then we'll move to the module. Yeah. Um, so what is the sensitivity of detection? So what is the lowest number of trees that should be there to be predicted? For, for 16S? Yeah. Uh, well, in our first paper, it was actually really low. Um, so we did a rare fraction, and I believe the cutoff was 100 before we saw a drop in accuracy. I wouldn't want to go that low uh, nowadays. I mean, it's just... I don't think anyone goes that low, right, with 100 sequences. I mean, most people have 10,000 or more, so I don't, I don't think there's a big factor with that with PyCrust at all. I think if anything, it's, 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 our gold standard would be great if we had really high-depth metagenomes because you, you require a lot more to get that depth. Okay, so we'll cut off questions now. So we'll move to the lab. Mm -hmm.